This is the five minute review of laparoscopic surgery and focusing on abdominal access. So to start off with the abdominal wall anatomy, the uh, one of the most important things to remember here is just the layers of it. So the simplified layers of it are you're going to have skin and peritoneum, so those are the two outermost layers. And then you have inside of that you have fat underneath the skin, fat above the peritoneum, so preperitoneal fat. Then inside of the fat you have a, a sandwich of variable layers of um, fascia and muscles. So on the lateral wall, for example, the, this is these are the layers. So you'd have skin underneath that. You have a fatty campus fascia, scarpus fascia. Then you have the muscles, the external and internal obliques, transversalis, transversalis fascia, preperitoneal fat, and peritoneum. And so this this is the part. Um, that can change depending on where you are. For example, if you're over the rectus muscle, then you'd have um, different muscle layers than, and fascia layers. The peritoneal fold, so what's the middlemost fold called? Or the middlemost ligament called? That's the median umbilical ligament. How about the the more lateral, the two la folds lateral to that? Those are the medial ligaments. And then the most lateral are just called the lateral folds of the peritoneum and they house the inferior epigastric artery. And it's important to know here that the round ligament comes in here lateral to the lateral fold. So the round ligament comes lateral to the inferior epigastric arteries um, where it enters the inguinal uh, rings. Muscle layers, so you have the external oblique going like your hands in your pocket, the internal oblique sort of making the opposite angle, and then the transversalis deep to those coming side to side. And then the other one to know about is the rectus abdominis coming from the pubic symphysis up to the xiphoid. Blood supply, the most important um, blood supply to the anterior abdominal walls from the inferior epigastric arteries. So where does that come from? you got the abdominal aorta coming down, dividing up into the common iliacs. Common iliacs divide up into the internal and external. After the inguinal ligament, the external becomes the femoral artery. And before the inguinal ligament, just right above it, it gives off the um, inferior epigastric artery. So that's where the inferior epigastric artery comes from, which is the most important uh, blood supply to the anterior part of the abdominal wall. So this is uh, the arcuate, arcuate line is a good thing to know about. So right now in this picture, are we above or below the arcuate line? We know we're above it because we've got an anterior and a posterior rectus sheath. So what are those? We have the aponeuroses of our three muscle layers in the lateral part of the wall. we got the external oblique and half of the internal oblique making the um, anterior part. And then you have the transversalis and the other half of the internal oblique making the uh, posterior rectus sheath. Underneath the uh, Underneath the aponeurosis of these muscles, you can see the transversalis fascia, here the dotted line going around, and then the peritoneum as the innermost layer. Surface anatomy wise, uh, so where is the where is the arcuate line? Just like with McBurney's point, you, you sort of use a relationship between the belly button and the anterior superior ili iliac spine to see where McBurney's point is, a third of the way up towards the navel. You can kind of do the same thing for the arcuate line. So you got the pubic symphysis here, the belly button here, go about a third of the way down. And that's roughly where the arcuate line is right there. Remember the belly butt 10 is at T10, where the abdominal aorta divides. So there's two types of ways to gain access to the peritoneum so that you can do laparoscopic surgeries and um, in inflate the abdomen. So one is the open technique, and this is um, favored by general surgeons, and the other is a closed technique of using a various needle, which is favored by people doing um, more pelvic type surgeries. So the open technique, you're using direct vis visualization, you're looking at what you're doing, you're in you incise down to the preperitoneal fat, get that out of the way, pull the peritoneum into the wound of the hemostat, open it up, sweep your finger around to make sure you, there's no adhesions or anything underneath your finger, then you can put the trocar in um, and create the pneuma peritoneum by um, inflating the abdomen with the, with the CO2 gas. So the other the other way to do it is uh, using the Verice needle. So that's a needle like this. It has a you know, sharp beveled edge, and inside of it there's a safety stylet. And so here's the abdomen. So you take the needle, you insert in, you, you insert into the abdomen, you're going to hear two two pops and a click. This is most commonly done at the, at, at the belly button. So the first, the first pop that you hear is when the needle goes through the abdominal fascia. The second pop that you hear is when it goes through the peritoneal or parietal fascia, and then the click you hear is when the safety stylet comes out. So you you put the needle through there, pop one, abdominal fascia, pop two, uh, peritoneal fascia, click, safety stylet popping out. And the safety stylet is just a dull thing that comes out of the inside of the needle to prevent um, the sharp beveled edge from damaging anything important um, underneath the needle. Remember that the most common place to do this is the belly button and what's right underneath the belly button, the abdominal aorta and where it's dividing into the uh, common iliacs. So pneuma peritoneum, uh, this is when you put the CO2 in and um, inflate the abdomen. So it's usually 
down to about 15 degree, 15 millimeters of mercury, so that's the pressure. And it works like a furnace, so if a little bit of CO2 leaks out, the machine puts in a little bit more to keep it at, to keep it at what you set the pressure to be. So this uh, pressure in the abdomen has some f physiologic effects, so the way I think about it is sort of twofold. The first thing is that it's, r it's stressful for a person, so um, your MAP goes up, your systemic and pulmonary vascular resistance go up, and then the second thing, so that's one, and then two is that it's like having a big mass in your stomach, so your venous return goes down, uh, your vital capacity goes down, the lungs have a harder time filling up. With a decreased venous return, what would you expect the heart rate to do? i will probably go up to try to compensate, uh, but it can't fully compensate, so your cardiac output goes down. So putting a bunch of CO2 into the into the person, into the abdomen, you'd think that that could combine with um, with water, get in, or get into the blood, and combine with water, then you'd have um, carbonic anhydrase, right, so you'd make a bicarb and you'd make strong acids or you think maybe that would really drop the pH for the person and be um, bad or dangerous but in in practice it's not because you have endogenous buffers and you can blow off more of the CO2 so adding all that CO2 doesn't actually um, create enough strong acids uh, to clinically significantly lower the pH so you want to ensure especially if you're using like a Verice needle and you don't have direct visualization that you're actually in the, inside of the pneumoperitoneum so you wait, the way you do that is a water drop test so you take um, some water and try to drop it down into the hole that you've made in the peritoneum, and if the water can f freely flow into the abdomen, then you, that means you're probably into the into the peritoneum. If the water if the water doesn't, that means that the that it's probably not a sort of no pressure type situation, and the and the you're not in the right place. You're not in the peritoneum. You haven't um, gotten through all the layers that you need to. So that's the water drop test. You can also like inject um, saline and try to suck it back out, and if it comes back out, that means you're probably not in the right place because it should just be able to uh, move into the abdomen if you're inside of the peritoneum. So there's different sites you can use to access the the abdomen and get inside the peritoneum. The most common ones the the belly button. So that's a fusion of fascial layers, that subcutaneous fat, which is why it's um, a good access site. It's the most common place for the various needle to be used. The posterior part of it's made up of the um, median and medial ligaments. We've talked about those um, perit those folds of peritoneum that have to do with uh, remnants from em embryology. Contraindications using the belly button if there's um, a hernia there, an umbilical hernia, or if there's problems with the urachus. Remember, the urachus is just what drains the, the fetal bladder. So there's the belly button, there's the fetal bladder, and connecting that's um, a urachus. So if there's like a, um, a diverticulum or, or something like that at the belly button, you wouldn't want to use that site. So adding additional trocars, this is also gets back to why it's important to know about those uh, peritoneal folds because you can. Once you put your initial uh, trocar into the belly button, you can put the camera in, and so you can look around and see what you're doing. So when you add secondary ones, you want to make sure that you're not um, going to injure anything. And the thing that you really want to make sure you don't injure is the inferior epigastric um, vessels. So if we go back to to this picture, we can see how to we can see how to do that. So if we we, we put our camera in and we're looking, we can find the medial ligaments. We should go lateral to those and find the lateral folds, and inside of those should be the inferior epigastric artery. So we're, po we're poking on the trocar. You can see the um, that it pushes in sort of by the pressure that it, that it makes when you're pushing on it. Make sure that you're not um, hitting that, so you want to go lateral to that. Or you can identify where the round ligament is and make sure that you're going lateral to that. So now we're on to some of the complications. So major complications, a lot of times they occur during this initial entry period, and you can have damage to large vessels, abdominal aorta, common iliacs, or bowel. Most common vessel by number injured, however, is the inferior epigastric artery. We talked about ways you can avoid doing that. You can have um, injury to the bladder, so you put a folding to try to prevent that. Let's say you did have injury, how might you suspect that? If you saw like air or blood in the in the Foley bag, that might make you suspect that. DVTs, try to prevent those with PCD or SCD boots. Stomach or bowel injury, you can help prevent with OG tube. If you see intra-abdominal air on a CT or an X-ray after a laparoscopic operation, doesn't necessarily mean that you've injured the bowel um, because it's very, if you image everyone, a lot of people would have um, some intra-abdominal air after a laparoscopic operation. But if you see the intra-abdominal air increasing, for example, or you have other reasons to be suspicious, then you might be concerned about that. So some of the more unique ones to, to doing this laparoscopic operation and creating pneumoperitoneum, so that's a CO2 embolus, pneumothorax, hernia, big trocar sites, and then shoulder pain, so the stretching and irritating the diaphragm, C345 referring up to the shoulder. So nerve injury, that could be a it's like a typical patient positioning thing, so like the lateral knee positioning, um, perineal nerve, um, a peroneal nerve injury, um, foot drop. Uh, you can also have femoral cutaneous nerve injury causing some anesthesia to the anterior part of the thigh. So the complications, um, there's 
two sort of categories to think about. So one would be things that make it problematic or dangerous to get that abdominal access to get through the peritoneum. So you, you, you can create the pneumoperitoneum. So that could be things like adhesions, distensions, or mass masses. And there can be problems um, that make it more dangerous to create a pneumoperitoneum in the person. So that'd be cardiopulmonary disease, a diaphragmatic hernia, or some sort of shunt or drain that's draining into the abdomen, like um, a VP shunt, because you're going to increase the pressure a lot in the abdomen. So if things are draining into it, then you, um, you'd want to think uh, twice about that before doing a laparoscopic operation. So some of the questions that you can get asked, so we'll do a quiz style. So what's the physiology of pneumoperitoneum? Stressful, so your MAP goes up, systemic, pulmonary vascular resistance go up. It's like having a big mass, so your um, venous return goes down, your vital capacity goes down, your, your venous return goes down, your heart wants to compensate, tries to crank the heart rate up, but it can't quite fully compensate, so your cardiac output in net goes down. Why do you use CO2? Well, it's non-combustible. It's, it's more soluble, so there's less risk of a CO2 embolus. When you're using the Varese needle, you hear some pops and a click. So what are those? The first one, the first pop, abdominal fascia, the second pop, um, peritoneal fascia, then the click, safety style like coming out. So the general advantages to laparoscopic operations are quick recovery, less pain, less scarring, less ileus. So how do you avoid the inferior epigastric? Well, you use your your camera that you've inserted when you've put um, the first trocar in the belly in, in the belly button side of the umbilicus site um, to find the round ligament. Make sure that you go lateral to that, so stay lateral to the round ligament. And then closing trocar sites, yes, you do need to close them if if they're large. And closing them means um, actually closing some of the fascia underneath the incision that you made in the skin. Um, and so questions that you could ask, you could ask if do people use any techniques to reduce shoulder pain. So there's there's ideas that if you get all the CO2 out, like you do positive pressure ventilations, keeping the um, trocar sites open, or if you bathe um, the peritoneal cavity in some sort of diluted anesthetic, that might reduce shoulder pain. You can see if people actually use those in practice. So that's our quick uh, review of of um, laparoscopic surgery and specifically how to access the abdomen.